Okay, pleased to welcome the uh, Veterans Collective for their update. Okay, can everyone hear me? You I've been instructed to speak into the microphone, so I'm not ignoring you over right here, forgive me. Um, thank you everyone, my name is Brian DeAndrea. I am Senior Vice President at Century Housing Corporation, and we're one of the three members of the West LA Veterans Collective that you'll hear from today. Uh, for starters, on behalf of the collective, I want to recognize General Hopper, uh, Anthony, Dr. Bamberger, and uh, Phil Mangano for your service on the VCUB. Thank you for all your years of dedication and, and, and interest in getting this right. We, we appreciate what you do. Um, today we'll be updating you on the PD's activities, PD being the Principal Developer's Activities, which have accelerated. Uh, excited to share that progress with you, which in large part is due to the partnership with the VA. Um, you know, the, the VA team, both GLA and OEM, has continued to address infrastructure, like I spoke to earlier, uh, demolition abatement needs, parcel release needs, closings. Um, they've literally moved mountains of dirt, mountains of steam line, mountains of IT equipment, and they don't often get the, the praise that they deserve. I think without our VA partner, none of what you see today would, would be happening, so thank you. Um, I'm going to jump right in. We can move on to slide number two. So we'll, we'll, we'll walk you through kind of the current lineup of projects, give you a flavor, and then we've got some larger picture things that we'll share with you. So building 404, this is a century project. This is a new construction build fronting building 207, consisting of 73 apartment homes, mix of studio and one bedrooms. Uh, building 207 is unique in that it has a par podium parking garage that's now been formed. Uh, me, and we're now framing. Um, we are slated for completion late next year. Uh, our team is on site this week, and we had a resident, a curious resident from Building 207, looking through the fence, uh, commenting on what an amazing amount of progress he's seen, and, and just complimenting the contractor for the work that they're doing in it. It really kind of dawned on us that this is a live, functioning community at this point. We have neighbors, right? There's a, there's a couple hundred people now living on the North Campus. Actually, when you when you include all of the, the residents on the North Campus, I think we have close to a thousand vets. Um, next slide, please. Building 156 and 157 is an adaptive reuse of the old TB hospital on the North Campus. This development will consist of 112 apartment homes, a mix of studios and ones. The interior demolition is underway. We closed uh, a couple months ago and we are slated for completion presently in late spring of 2025. This is a incredibly complicated build in a very sensitive area of the campus. Lots going on in terms of adjacent construction activity by other EUL developers, not to mention infrastructure work that is being done by both our team and the VA team. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars of work going on all around us uh, with residents living across the street. So we're doing our best to be good neighbors and uh, do this in such a way as to mitigate impacts on, on both the VA team and uh, all of the, the, the veteran neighbors that live uh, around us. I'm gonna hand things off right now to Tyler Monroe from TSA who will update you on building 402, which should be the next slide. And Tyler is presenting virtually today. I'm actually presenting on Tyler's behalf. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm here to share some updates with you on VA Building 402, which you can see on screen. VA 402 is just to the north of 156 and 157 that Brian was updating you on. It's 120 units of ground up new construction. This is our modular project on the campus. So you can see a lot of progress being made in that photo on the right. As of now, we have all of our modules on site, which is uh, great and a relief to all. So this project is 107 studios. We have 11 two bedroom units, and then there's two two bedroom units set aside for our managers. And all of our units are of course set aside for formerly homeless veterans. It is a non-age restricted building, which deviates from what we did with VA 207, which as you all know, we're conserved for senior formerly homeless veterans. We started construction, we closed our financing and started construction back in January of this year. 
Uh, we're on track to complete construction at the tail end of 2024. Let's call it Q125 as shown on screen. Um, and we're happy to report that things are coming along. We survived the rains, we survived the hurricane, and uh, we're excited for next steps. So I'll hand it back to Brian, who's gonna update you on 158. Thank you, Parisa. Next slide, please. Building 158 is the sister building to buildings 156, 57. It's part of that three building cluster. This is an adaptive reuse uh, that will consist of 49 apartment homes uh, uh, um, that includes entirely one bedrooms. We are slated to close this development in November of this year and we'll break ground immediately thereafter with expected completion in the summer of 20. 25. This is um, an exciting deal for us. Uh, we have some new partners that we brought into the table. Uh, CREA, uh, a syndicator of low-income housing tax credits with USAA as the investor behind that syndicator, along with Chase Bank. Uh, so they'll be involved with bringing this development uh, to life, and we're excited about those new partnerships. I'm going to invite up Tess, who will provide an update on US FETS Building 210. Sorry for the mask. Um, how can you hear me okay? Uh, so building 210, as we know, is adaptive reuse. Unit count is 38 units, 37 fast. Yes, hold on, hold on just a second. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Go ahead, Tess. Continue. Maybe start over, Tess. Sure. Thanks. Uh, building 210. <laughs> It's actually been moved up in the schedule. Uh, we were anticipating building 300 before that. Um, however, building 210 will be adaptive reuse. So it will be 38 units. So 37 bash and one manager unit. The population is women veterans preference and also all veterans. Construction will start in May of 2024 and finish in December, 2025. And if you're wondering if the information is different from what's on the slide. It was an updated slide that unfortunately didn't make it into the presentation. Services include VASH case management, mental and physical health, substance abuse, women veterans programming specifically. There is the uh, women veterans on point program that we are going to incorporate. There'll be family and children's services because some of these units will also accommodate women veterans with children. And then also there will be um, a services coordinator and family program staff on site as well. I think um, the services staffing is accurate. So that's building 210. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'd like to speak. I, uh, Thank you, Tess. Email. Okay, next slide, please. I think we're waiting for Eugene. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's not. All right, we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this slide, but this is a slide actually we shared back in June when we last met with you. This is a representation of progress against the minimum 1,200 units um, that the VA has committed to as part of the draft master plan. Uh, you can see by the end of this year, we will be more than collectively, more than halfway towards our goal, which is an incredible accomplishment um, so we're very excited about that. And I say that because we have, and you'll hear later today from uh, core companies, but between building 158 and MacArthur Field B closing, we'll be close to 741 units, I believe. Uh, so more than halfway. Uh, next slide, please. This slide paints a picture of some of the upcoming phase two developments, including parcel release and including the capital commitments that we have received to date. Um, you, could you uh, forward one slide, please? Thank you. So we've called out in the orange font those projects that are part of our community hub and town center area, the four projects building 13, 407, 8, 9, and 10, uh, comprise of more than 350 homes. And you can see that to date, we've raised close to $121 million of capital commitments towards those projects. We're excited about that. Next slide, please. This is also a slide I shared uh, back in June at the Bob Hope Patriotic Hall. And this is simply meant to give you a flavor uh, for 
the massive amount of capital that has been raised on the North Campus. This does not just include the work of the PD, but this includes all developments, all EUL developments on the North Campus, including the VA's infrastructure work that is supporting all of the housing developments. Uh, so more than $830 million to date and counting, I should add. And like I said, this is not meant to be scientific, but to give you just an order of magnitude of just the tremendous amount of capital that has been leveraged. Next slide, please. Okay, the topic du jour. Um, I spent a few minutes talking about the town center area. Uh, as you know, the PD was selected back in 2018 to create a thriving community uh, on the North Campus in service to our veterans. Last year, after a number of years of intense planning and legal work and outreach, we finally executed our 99-year uh, EUL that contemplates all of these phase two parcels that are uh, in and around what is called the, the town center area. And so now with you know the amount of progress we've made on phases zero and one, uh, we've begun turning our attention to this phase two area. And like I just mentioned, this covers close to 350 homes with a very healthy amount of supportive service and neighborhood level service space. Uh, we know that housing alone is not enough to promote re recovery. Uh, and that community is an absolutely important and critical uh, ingredient. Uh, recently, you might have seen the U.S. Surgeon General uh, released a report that spoke to an epidemic of isolation that our country faces. And this is certainly something that is, is, is uh, applicable to our veteran community as well. Uh, our community plan establishes two primary hubs, a health and wellness hub centered around and anchored by Building 300, uh, on the North Campus, and a civic and administrative and community hub uh, anchored around Building 13 in this town center or Phase 2 area. Uh, the co-location of service space uh, and basic neighborhood services within a, within a housing community is really what makes this community special and what the community needs, providing a sense of belonging and purpose to all of the residents on the North Campus. I, um, I, I made note earlier of the, of the comment about a need for achieving balance, in particular acuity balance in the population. It's something that we've been talking about for a long time and we're absolutely um, committed to working with the VA to ensure that level of balance exists. We want this to be a self-sustaining and thriving community. Um, the phase two area that we're talking about will facilitate any number of opportunities for engagement within this piece of real estate. Um, all anchored by a collection of EUL developments. Uh, it's important to note, and I think Anthony earlier spoke about the PEIS process, but we've now, you know, we're several years, um, for several years now we've cleared the NEPA and CEQA processes uh, for this plan. We've raised a lot of capital in the area that I spoke about. We've done a tremendous amount of outreach and engagement with the veteran community, and that is outreach and engagement that continues. That will never stop. We're constantly listening and we were encouraged yesterday to hear from ULI with their preliminary recommendations. That process of listening will absolutely continue. Um, we know that this concept that you have before you is not static and I am pleased to share uh, that we've recently uh, engaged a group of world-class planners at Moral Possibilities. Um, that said, uh, I think what ULI shared yesterday is encouraging, helping us think about a framework for uh, the veterans of today and the veterans of generations to come. We look at the ULI study and we think it supports 90% of what's in the community plan. It, it confirms and validates our approach that we need a central gathering area, a town square, a town green. These are critical spaces um, and they're part of the ULI study. So for us, it was actually quite validating. Um, you know, this area we think represents the clearest and most immediate path to getting to the minimum 1,200 units. I know you heard about an alternative plan earlier. There are a number of constraints, um, and I think we'll, we'll look to hear from the VA on that. Um, but our planning in this area is underway, and we feel the need to press on. You know, despite the tremendous resources we poured into veteran homelessness, we continue um, to experience, you know, more than 4,000 vets in LA continue to experience homelessness. Uh, we have, you know, not only a contractual obligation, but a moral obligation to act with, with urgency. 
Um, you know, and, and, and Tess will speak to this momentarily, but the needs of veterans living on this campus today are not being fully met. We need these central hubs and gathering areas that are um, embodied in buildings 13 and 300 and some of the ancillary spaces around those buildings. It's opportunity um, and we're excited about it. Um, I'll just note that we, as part of our planning, we gently tapped the brakes in terms of this phase two area. Uh, we were anxiously awaiting the recommendations of UOI to, to hear what they had to say. Um, we're appreciative of their feedback. Look forward to fur further internalizing the report once it's made fully public. Uh, and clearly the VA has some things to consider. Um, but the, the ultimate governor that controls our ability to move forward is the parcel release schedule that we're, we're talking about. Um, you know, the next wave of buildings that the VA is prepared to hand over to us are slated for this concept of mixed use, building in a wealth of supportive service and neighborhood service space on the ground floor of these developments. You'll hear from Devin momentarily in terms of some of the, some of the things we're working through on that front, but we are absolutely motivated and anxious to press on and, and uphold our commitments to the VA. So I'm going to bring up Devin uh, to briefly talk about some of our legislative initiatives. Thank you, everyone. And um, I think, do we want to move to my slide? Uh, yeah. so, it's the advocacy one. Thank you. Um, so Hi, um, I was I emailed Jihan Jato yesterday. I never got the ability to do public comment. Only three people spoke. You Uh, for those of you um, who I haven't met here, my name is Devin Reinerson. I work for the PD here in Washington, D.C. as their uh, federal advocate. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, as you are, live, you, are currently, actually, you are currently censoring a member of the press by continuing to kick me. I signed up for public comment yesterday. I never got a response. We may have to deal with this a little bit. So ULI raised the issue yesterday of the, of the statutory challenges that the principal developer and, and frankly any developer on campus um, has with integrating services into areas covered by the enhanced use lease. Um, so right now the West LA Leasing Act of 2016 um, as amended by the uh, 2022 Act um, allows for three different types of leases on campus. One, the enhanced use lease, which the principal developer and others uh, are building housing under. Uh, you have the services leases, uh, and then you have the UCLA lease. The, as, as more and more uh, veterans live on campus, demand services, there is a real need to provide those services urgently. I'm um, going to and, keep calling until I get my three minutes. You are denying people from public comment. I emailed Chi Hung Seito. We'll just keep counseling. Um, and, and so as, uh, as the principal developer and others work to provide services for the veterans on campus, um, there is a need to um, really ensure that those uses uh, specified in the West LA Leasing Act uh, for things like, you know, just the, the general services and also those community amenities that, um, you know, are envisioned in the master plan can be provided. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the PD team is engaging Congress and, um, and others in the community about ways to really provide for uh, the legal framework to ensure that those services can be provided. Um, and, and really, as you compare what can be done on the West LA campus compared to every other campus, uh, under Section 705 of the, of the PACT Act, um, those can services that can be provided uh, on the West LA campus. The um, just public input. Please provide the journalist the public input. General, can we get anyone who talks on the phone to identify themselves? That was Francisco Ward. Let's keep a record of these interruptions. Uh, so, so in, ensuring that the um, uses at the West LA campus um, are allowable um, <coughs> as they would be on any other campus. Uh, and so I, I think 
with that, I will. Then you should stop that. subleasing the land. Brian DeAndre is <coughs> apparently making half a million dollars. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Laney from U.S. Vets uh, will give a quick update on the Veterans Promise campaign and the uh, uh, development activities. Thank you, uh, Laney Capkin, U.S. Vets. Uh, I work uh, to engage the community in supporting this project. Uh, just as avidly as uh, VA and uh, our electeds have. So uh, the slide here outlines the Veterans Promise Campaign. Our charge is to raise funds in support of the existing gaps uh, that will bring our project to fruition. Um, the individual funds and objectives are outlined and our priorities have been similar timelines alongside the phased development of the campus. Uh, so our first focus was pre-development efforts, and then uh, rightfully our next focus was veteran housing. Uh, those are the two funds that are now closed uh, and that have helped us arrive at uh, just over $87 million committed in total toward the goal of $188 million. Our next priorities include projects in phase two, uh, ranging from uh, the chapel to uh, the service spaces on campus. And you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, a wonderful article uh, that we placed in Angeles Magazine, which reaches faith communities across the country, uh, engaging faith leaders in Los Angeles, uh, including Monsignor Torgerson of, of St. Monica's Church um, and the Archdiocese Chapel in, uh, in educating the community about our vision and engaging them in supporting it. Uh, so we're excited to continue this work to support the development of projects uh, in phase one and two and beyond. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the community itself. I know that we spend a lot of time talking about the housing developments themselves, uh, things like commercial space, but at the heart of our efforts really is the community itself. So those are structures such as the therapeutic community, which really is a planned environment. It exploits the therapeutic value of social and group processes. And I think it's really important to remember our true north here is serving the veterans and also serving especially those veterans who reside on the campus in the RASH programs. Um, as you can imagine, there are a variety of different needs within that population, uh, some of them more challenging than others. Mix is also very important. However, uh, I, I really think that, you know, working within the community, being immersed in the community, you really can't discount the power of connectedness. Um, as you heard Brian say, isolation has been called an epidemic by the Surgeon General and working directly with the population, being immersed, hearing their concerns, seeing their needs firsthand, I know that the antidote to that is community connectedness. So there are a few points here. Um, we could talk about the systems, the macro systems in place, like the backbone, which is absolutely crucial. It convenes the environment together. Um, it guides vision and strategy. So a lot of the work that's been going on on the ground of late has been working on aligned activities, with planning, with outside community partners like Military and Veterans Affairs, uh, with the LA Veterans Collaborative, with the numerous groups that already exist on the campus with the sections. Um, I know sometimes it's easy to talk about this campus in terms of what we're going to do. Uh, I see it from a lens of what's already been done and what is being done. And that includes the 640 veterans in the programs already. That includes those who have moved into the housing that's opened up and the support and services for them. So the results of our efforts really have been to increase feelings of membership and belonging, to increase influence and to share emotional connection. And I will tell you that coming into the building, 
some of the veterans um, at our community meeting, which is our town hall essentially held every month, said to me, I never realized how much I needed this community until I got here. Uh, so my focus has been working on that, putting that in place, implementing tools, communication tools, uh, and also community-wide resources like the website and items like that. So if you have any questions, let me know. But um, we're also glad to present our 2023 20, annual report that you'll see in front of you. Are they actually contemplating a tower? Yeah. Okay, could you um, move forward, I think, two slides, please? There we go. Oh, one, back one. All right, this just gives you a flavor of the roadmap for 2024 and beyond. Obviously, a lot of construction going on. We'll begin preparing for lease-ups. There'll be mass lease-ups of numerous buildings uh, beginning late next year and end it early 2025, so we'll begin preparations for that. Um, we're making significant connectivity improvements thanks to some of the state funding. That's the ASIC and IIG. Uh, acronyms you see on the screen. Uh, working on phase two pre-development, advancing this community hub uh, design and, and uh, hopefully moving forward with some of the individual developments there. Continuing the fundraising that Laney spoke about. We'll continue to advocate uh, for some of the legislation that we think would be helpful uh, to deliver on the promise uh, of this community. Um, Tess just talked about the backbone organization. This is becoming increasingly uh, critical now that we have hundreds and hundreds of residents in support of housing on the North Campus, bringing partners to the table, coordinating activities, trying to eliminate some of the redundancies that we're seeing. Uh, and I spoke about the lease up. So uh, with that, I think we'll conclude our formal presentation and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, it looks like Mr. Beglin is up first. Uh, good afternoon, Brian, and thanks for the presentation. It is great to see the progress. And as you say, it's getting to the point now where there are residents on the North Campus who get to see how much still is to occur occurring. It's pretty extraordinary. For those of you who haven't been on campus in the last six months or a year, I really would encourage you to do so. It's an incredibly encouraging development. Um, I want to circle back to something that I mentioned, I think, to you about six months or eight months ago and that was i did not want the principal developer to engage in pre-development around the town center because i thought the issue of what the scope of the town center was and whose responsibility it was was an unsettled issue and i don't want to rehash that debate uh, this board i think has a has a view about that and and uh, we've spoken about it many times um but I was surprised to see in one of the slides that you had done a lot of funding commitments for buildings that are within the town center area. So could we look at, um, I think it's the slide called upcoming phase two developments. It was pretty early in the deck. Yeah, I think if you go back maybe four or five slides. There you go. That's it, yeah. Um, so this slide indicates that you already are obtaining funding commitments for buildings in the town center area. So the big ones obviously of concern to us are building 13, uh, 410, 407. Um, what are, are these funding commitments all of the same form? Can you tell us what it means to have received a funding commitment, for example, of building 13 of 15 or $16.4 million? So thank you, Rob, for the question. Um, and I'll just share that this is actually the same content that was delivered at the June VCOEB meeting. Um, we simply organized it a little bit differently and called out um, kind of a, a breakdown of the resources at the bottom of the slide. Um, the resources that have been committed uh, com comprise not only some private philanthropy, uh, but also the PACT Act resources. Um, and I think um, as we note here that, you know, those, those resources remain to be negotiated at the EUL level. Um, but there is, I think, in broad stroke, a commitment from the VA. This is the 360 million or so um, that was sized according to the anticipated capital needs of many of these projects. Okay, so for example, when the slide indicates $16.4 million towards building 13, that doesn't necessarily include any uh, LIHTC funds, does it? No, the LIHTC, and the, the LIHTC funds are the last 
uh, source that we apply for. We, we build our budgets, we, we, we stack our commitments, and the, the last funding application we make is for credits or credits and bonds. Okay, so the, the fact that these monies have been committed doesn't establish that they've been committed for the purposes of support of housing, does it? Well, these resources have been specifically committed for these projects. But they've been committed as a supportive housing project? Yes, as supportive housing. That, that, that was the basis of the ask to the private philanthropic community and the basis of the, the PACT Act analysis that, that uh, we, we worked on with the VA. Okay, so it, it, this identifies $222 million in funding commitments, and I guess on the lower right-hand corner, you say 161 of those commitments is from the PACT Act, right? Yes. So the Delta, approximately $60 million, what does that come from? You're taking a delta between the town center projects and the pack. So we're not able to, they're not meant to. Oh, they're not tied to one another. No. So the 161 is not a subset of 225. The 161 is a subset of the 222. 222. Just like the 121 is a subset of the 222. Okay. So the delta between 222 and 161, what are those other funding sources? Well, for those projects, that would be the, the private philanthropic resources. So you have $80 million in private philanthropic commitments? 60 or $60 million? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're associating funding sources in a way that, that is, you know, we have private philanthropic commitments for a number of these projects. Separately, we have the PACT Act resources that have been essentially earmarked, yet to be negotiated. You know, the qualifier is important that have been separately committed. Okay, I'm, I'm still, I'm still at a loss. None of this is the LIHTC funding for construction of units, and a large portion of it is the PACT Act funds. What other principal funding sources have you received commitments? The from? private philanthropic resources that I've been referring to. And what's the level of those commitments? I don't have it broken out here, but it's probably for these projects on the order of, I don't know, 40 to $60 million. We could break it out if you like. Okay. Um, I would just I'd remind you that we had a lively debate over the scope of the revisions to the master plan 2022. And there were a lot of people on the committee who weighed in pretty strongly to think that we thought that the vision of the town center was being diluted by the master plan 2022 revisions. And we really pushed hard for a third party, uh, the Urban Land Institute, to come in. And they've offered us their preliminary recommendation. <clears throat> and I think it's probably going to propel a revision of the new master plan back to a more ambitious notion. So at least from my point of view, the question of the scope of the town center and who best ought to execute it, and even the time frame for execution is still up for refinement. That's just my perspective. Okay. And you know, you and I have talked about it many times. We've talked about the scope of the memorandum of understanding. Um, but I've, I think I've made my position clear on what I think constitutes good planning. Uh, I understand that, and I respect your your opinion. Um, we have a PEIS and a PAR that have been certified. We have a 99-year ground lease that was signed last year that identified this slate of parcels. We've been tasked with creating housing as rapidly as possible in a responsible way to address the needs of our veterans today. I mentioned that we have tapped the brakes, right, in light of the feedback, the anticipated feedback on the ULI study. And like I said earlier, we were greatly encouraged. We think the ULI study is wholly consistent with what we have planned in our community plan. Um, so, you know, our client is the, is the VA. We're, you know, waiting for the, the final recommendations to come out, but, but thank you for your feedback. Okay, Ms. Stanley, uh, Dr. Bamberger, Mr. Allman. Uh, Christine Stanley, for the record. I'd like to discuss or hear how the residents are actually doing um, and what are you seeing as like the biggest obstacles to provide support to them? Um, and how they are really adjusting to a permanent 
supportive housing life? I would say that overall, the veteran residents uh, are happy with their housing situation. Uh, we certainly give a lot of opportunities for input. It's actually very important and meaningful uh, input as well as you know collecting it at events and things like that. So from what I have heard, uh, we get a lot of thanks actually. They're very grateful. You know, thank you for being here. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for going into this line of work. Um, there have certainly been challenges, so I wouldn't whitewash that. I mean, we do have a population, especially in building 207, there are 26 units for those with severe mental illness. Um, I uh, have PTSD myself, right? So you can't really look at somebody and kind of decide what their status is. There, there are various clinical levels of need, as we heard previously yesterday. But sometimes, you know, challenges do arise. Issues come out, people get triggered. Um, there are just various different challenges that happen on the ground. And of course, um, having a well-trained staff who's equipped to deal with the challenges is an important piece of serving the veterans um, that we serve. But overarchingly, I think that the environment is positive. We've gotten really great feedback about the caring nature of the staff. I think the staffing is a very important piece. I know we've worked very hard with VA and VASH um, on our selection of staff members. So do you have additional questions? I do. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, I'm really curious because we're creating an, uh, a place, a home for these individuals that have, um, well, we could say a, a great need either mental health or um, substance use or even just age. And you've opened the door and to start um, engaging with them and providing a place to stay. Yes. So there's, as this multiplies and we, we say 900 um, individuals in need in a designated area. Yes. Um, I appreciate the that they're grateful for be there, but like, what are really the issues? Like, what are some of the things that we should be aware of, like as a safety concern or staffing? Because supportive services is difficult to keep people hired in any ways, and now we have this unique situation. So, how are we going to take care of? Like, what do we need to do for the employees? What do we need to provide to them for a safety measure? Like, what are the residents like? Are they able to eat? Are they able to have transportation? Absolutely. Are they, like we know their medical needs are being met, but how are they getting down to the VA? Let me preface this answer because I know um, our community members wanted to watch. So there are probably quite a few of them watching this presentation. I promise you all nothing about you without you. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of our challenges uh, to the gentleman and the one lady in the building. So I just wanted to tell them that if they're watching. Um, there are absolutely um, aging related challenges that have come to light sometimes. Um, I think that's to be expected in part and parcel of when you have a building of 62 and over veterans. Uh, there have been, you know, challenges in terms of, again, trigger, getting triggered, um, challenges with, of course, loneliness. Uh, I've heard that directly. Um, wanting to engage with opportunities greater than what they have in front of them, so seeking employment. Um, one of the veterans in the building um, is in the arts, so he participates in the arts and he'll be playing his guitar for um, our next community meeting. Whereas before, you know, he, he wasn't really keen on doing that. So kind of finding the drive to want to create and share that with, you know, his neighbors. Um, so you mentioned the scope and the widening scope, and that definitely is something that GLA, OEM, and the PD team were concerned about. Uh, with the support and permission of VA, uh, we are going to be opening outside of building 210 a temporary services area. So a trailer that's being custom built that will afford us um, some things that are pretty clearly missing in the community. And a community meeting space is one of those things. Absolutely vital if you wanna hold a community meeting, you would have to go down to building 500 or try to find space somewhere on the campus. Um, which is one of the reasons why the town center is really important in that aspect. Um, but also in building 300, the services space, it's not going to be um, expansive enough to um, both provide the supportive services and then have that community aspect. So I'm greatly encouraged. We will have a conference room. I did the calculations. 60 people will be able to do more joint programming. And we do, you know, 
work jointly with the other developers as well. Every other week I convene a meeting with Shangri-La and CORE and their services teams um, in, in addition to TSA. So um, it's, it's a really evolving process, right? So figuring out what veterans on the ground want and what they need, looking at you know, the clinical need of course through VASH. Um, but I am greatly encouraged that through that feedback and through that constant attention to their needs, we're able to provide something meaningful and useful to them. Thank you. I would love, I'm leaving the board, but uh, make a suggestion to invite some of the residents to come present and share um, what their experience has been like and uh, maybe where they've been and where they see themselves going uh, for a future meeting. I think they would absolutely love that. Thank you. Dr. Bamberger. Josh Bamberger, for the record. Um, Brian, Teresa, let's say we had 10 veterans whose income was between 50 and 70% area median income. And we want to try to house them either in existing buildings now or buildings that are be being built in the future under your portfolio. How can we do that? What can you do with us to make that work so that these folks who potentially are over the income limit for some of the funding that you have, how would you house them? Dr. Bamberg, I'll answer that. Um, and then if anyone else um, online would like to weigh in, please feel free. But I think there are two pathways. Um, well, one, we should look at the data and look at TSA's experience on building 207 and the effort they went through to adjust all of the regulatory agreements on the property to allow up to 60% EMI, giving back money to the city of Los Angeles and what the outcome of, of that was, and I'll let them speak to that. Um, but let's just say theoretically you had 70% AMI veterans that we wanted to serve, that needed housing, that deserved housing. How would we serve them? We would either have to go through a similar effort to the extent we're talking about projects that are under construction now, we'd have to go through a similar effort to what TSA did to adjust those regulatory agreements. Not impossible, but a lot of work. Um, Alternatively, we could look for legislative fixes. I know yesterday, um, and, and thanks to Dr. Harris for a lot of the work he's doing on this legislative front, um, there's potentially some legislative, legislative fixes that could effectively wave a magic wand and allow for the exclusion of certain types of income that would make veterans yeah, qualify. Yeah, I don't because we're short on time, but I will. Um, we understand those things. I'm talking about what okay. you can do, not necessarily what Congress can do or what the president All can right. do. What can you guys do with what you have today and what you have in your funding streams going forward that could potentially house these people? So I, I think for, built, for housing that is under construction today, what you would have to do is adjust regulatory agreements, barring any kind of a legislative fix. For housing that is being planned, certainly being mindful of the need for increased, increasing AMI flexibility um, and baking that in up front. Because often we, we, we assemble multiple layers of financing and some of the commitments we make as it relates to population, as it relates to unit mix, as it relates to AMI, those commitments are made very early on in a project. And so, you know, by the time you get to the tax credit application, that's the last funding that comes in, and that's the last set of essentially regulatory requirements that are placed on the property. But oftentimes, you've already committed to higher levels of affordability early in the process. Right, I'm thinking about again. this earlier. I'm here. sorry. We, we're really short of time and that we're already over. The, basically, your answer is if I send someone with 70% AMI to you now, you could not house them. That's fine. We know that. That's cool. We, we'll make. We'll come to some solutions. Parisa, any other ideas? Still I would on. Reiterate what Brian. Ju I would reiterate what Brian just said, which is, if in the next few months it becomes very clear the data indicate that we have hundreds, you know, dozens of veterans who are over the fifty percent limit, then we would begin the exact process we went through on two hundred seven, which was a, a very hands-on effort to amend all those regulatory agreements and get approvals from all the different stakeholders involved. Um, if that's what the data indicate, then that's what we will do in order to house as many veterans as possible. Um, so that's a short answer, but I think that's, that's our cool. only option for the five, yep. soon to be six projects that are already under construction. And, and then something else you and I spoke about, um, if you did all this effort, to try to get up to 60% AMI, and you didn't get anyone between 50 and 60 who went into the uh, buildings. Is that right? I don't know if you know that or. As I know, we, we uh, off the top, uh, Tess may know better, but I don't think we ended up moving in anybody at the 60% level into VA 207. 
Um, I'm sorry, that must be super frustrating. Process. That must be so frustrating because I know I want to. I want to end on a positive note because I'm being kind of rude, but I just want to acknowledge how much work you guys did to try to push the limit on that. And so was so grateful that you tried to find a way to house these veterans who have more than 50% AMI. And I imagine it's moderately frustrating the fact that there weren't anybody who was sent to you who was over 50% AMI who could have qualified for that extra 10% tranche. I think we're all just really glad to see the 30% AMI veterans housed because I think that's an, exactly what that AMI percentage was designed to do, that particular subset of veterans. So to have enough to fill the units um, and to see them become housed was a really great thing. Mr. Hallman. It's good to see the PD team. It's gonna be my last run at this. So I'm just gonna make a basic observation um you know since 2021 we've had a difference of opinion regarding what was appropriate uh with the selection process and you know i, I just the only thing i could recommend to va is similar to how, how ogc came in for naming guidance to clarify i think it would be really important for va office of general counsel to come in here in january and make a definitive opinion um, because what I hear and what doesn't make sense to me is in uh, 2021, VA, during the master planning sessions, admitted it did not have the authority for the mixed use that was proposed in the master plan, and nothing has changed. So if that's the case, then I don't understand how you were selected to do something VA currently does not have the legal authority to do. I... I it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me and i think ogc needs to to come up with an explanation and at the end of the day you know, as i said before i'm not saying that 408 409 410 all those shouldn't be developed i think right now is entirely too premature and considering all of the issues of land land use on this campus and given this campus's history why are we trying to do something that is murky at best? And this federal advisory committee has asked VA for many months to provide clarification. And in recommendation 1705, it, it provided a very generic answer. And here's what it said. It said, pursuant to the terms of the principal developer EOL, the principal developer may use the property during the term only for the project, which is defined as financing, design, development, construction, operation, and maintenance of supportive housing for homeless and at-risk veterans and their families thereon consisting of not less than 900 tenant units. That's what we've been given as an explanation regarding this selection. And I think it's, it's it's pretty narrow. So again, we have a difference of opinion, right? But if you're seeking additional legislative authority to fix the EUL program so that it matches the other nationwide authority, not the authority specific to this campus, how can the selection be appropriate? Anthony, the spaces we're talking about in our town center, center area are not reliant on the economics of the space. We can build the space. We can occupy that space with community-based support you services, can occupy the which space are, is allowable if under the allows the you to occupy the space. Occupy, if, correct? If you go to the statute, supportive housing is defined as housing that is connected with community-based support services. So we can occupy all those spaces we're talking about right with community-based support services under the statute. We have the authority to do that. If VA grants you the release. Correct. Subject to parcel release, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. yeah, exactly. And, and that process is spelled out in the PDEUL. And right. It's a prescriptive process. Right, so we know according to the parcel release schedule, parcel 408 is up for release in May of 2024, correct? That's, uh, that's yeah. on the parcel release. So VA has a decision to make in May of 2024. And, and that's the only thing I can stress to the decision makers at VA 
is that this is a very critical decision. We have a difference of opinion. We do. And you provide guidance to VA and we provide guidance to VA and, and hopefully they make the best decision. That's it. Okay, let's uh, move on to Jim Zinner. I think we're running out of time, Jim Zinner, um, so I'll keep it quick. Great job on uh, raising all the money. It takes money to build housing to get veterans off the streets, so thank you. Um, housing and service is a really difficult job, and I want to acknowledge that. Uh, very, very difficult job. Uh, beyond all the, you know, building the town center and everything else, it's a lot of work. So, um, you know, my question is just, you know, there's 4,000 veterans approximately that work in L.A. County. Where would I tell my colleagues to meet me at on the weekend on the campus to, you know, go out and have conversations uh, that, you know, would be appropriate? Because right now we meet at a VFW, we meet at like a Bastards Canteen, we meet somewhere that's not, you know, part of a, you know, housing complex. And so where do we meet? This is precisely the need, an indication of the need for hubs like Building 300 and Building 13. It's to create these types of third spaces where veterans from within or without the campus can gather, can take a walk. The town square, the town green, the town hall. Those are the three primary concepts within this larger, you know, under this larger rubric of town center. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, we're, we're trying to create place, right? Primarily for veterans that live on the campus, but also open and conducive to veterans that live beyond the campus. So basically the answer is I can tell my colleagues, we can meet at Villages Cabrillo in the community center and have a conversation. Well, Jim, I mean, we, we were selected five years ago, so we're running, we're sprinting right now and we're going as fast as we can in, in this whole second phase where we're pivoting towards is critical to create exactly the type of space you're talking about and it's why we're you know you know eager and anxious to press on yeah i guess i guess i just don't see it um and that's fine um but i just want to say i think that's a great idea christine uh, brought up about bringing veterans from the campus to give feedback i would also say we should probably bring some veterans that want to have space to socialize on the campus they don't live on the campus um, but i'll take that up with the incoming chair to make sure that happens okay. if i can just go back real quick to dr bamberger you know in terms we'll of future projects, uh, the, the income averaging is uh, an election we can make and i think we're going to give a lot of thought to making that election as we go forward unfortunately the, the projects are not simply funded by tax credits so we've got other agencies we've got to work with and through like hcd i know there's some state legislation that is seeking to fix that um, but we want to have as much flexibility as we can to serve veterans experiencing the trauma of homelessness no matter what their income is okay thanks very much i'm sorry jim did you have some okay Okay, next up we have core companies. 